If you could just indicate that they're visible, please, Jane. Yes, they're there. Brilliant. Thanks so much. And lovely to join you all today. And I was able to join some of the sessions this morning. So um, great to be able to carry on with the, the discussion. So I wanted to talk uh, to you about work that I've done with my colleagues, uh, Catherine Smith, who's at University of Strathclyde, and Julia Lynch, who is at Pennsylvania University over in the States. And last year we published a book looking at the issue of COVID-19 and health inequalities. Um, this book is open access uh, via um, the Policy Press website and the link is there. Please do check it out um, after the event if you're interested, um, perhaps share with uh, students and colleagues. So just going to talk through some of what we cover in the book, some of the issues which we've seen in the pandemic, some of which was talked about um, in the sessions this morning as well, in terms of the interactions between health inequalities and COVID-19 inequalities. So first of all, I'll briefly set the scene about the different types of inequalities in COVID-19. I'm then going to reflect on the parallels with uh, what we can see from historical data in terms of socioeconomic inequalities in previous pandemics, such as uh, a Spanish flu pandemic from 1918. I'm then going to introduce the concept of a syndemic pandemic, whereby I talk through some of the pathways uh, where we buy, we see such big inequalities in, in COVID-19 uh, outcomes. And in the final section, I'm going to talk about what all this means in terms of levelling up and various governments' agendas around how we can build back better and reduce health inequalities in the future. So, as we've seen in some of the presentations this morning, we know there's a very strong relationship between um, area level deprivation and um, COVID-19 uh, mortality rates. And here, um, this is a graph just showing the differences by decile of IMD across the first uh, sort of uh, six months of the pandemic in England. So this is in wave one in, in uh, 2020. And we can see much higher rates with a much steeper increase in, in the most deprived neighbourhoods uh, during that period. And to put that into some kind of context, then uh, looking across to our neighbouring countries in Scotland and Wales, and we can see, for example, in, in Wales uh, during the uh, uh, the second year of the pandemic, for example, March to July 21, then the most deprived neighbourhoods had a, a mortality rate that was um, 121 deaths per 100,000, which is almost twice as high as the least deprived. We see this in Scotland, England, and we can also see these relationships in data from other countries. Um, we've recently completed a systematic review showing that this is a fairly consistent finding across um, uh, all, all um, high income countries. The second aspect, <clears throat> second kind of um, axes of inequality that uh, we wanted to touch upon in our work has been around the regional inequalities. And here I'm focusing on work we've done with the Northern Health Science Alliance looking at uh, regional inequalities in COVID-19 across England. We can see uh, the mapping there around COVID-19 uh, by uh, over the first year of the pandemic, so 2020 through 21, of uh, COVID-19 mortality deaths broadly mapping onto all cause mortality and we can see higher rates uh, particularly over in the northwest and certain parts of the northeast and also in london and we did some work together with university of, of, of manchester and other northern universities uh, looking at the interaction between um, local authority level deprivation and regional level deprivation in terms of what we find with these patterns for covid19 and in this uh, bar chart, you can see that for COVID-19 mortality, um, the rates are particularly high in deprived areas of the north, particularly, you know, they're higher in deprived areas of the north compared to equally deprived areas of the south. And you can also see with the red bars that the more affluent local authorities in the north, their rates are very similar to affluent um, areas in the south. So we can see this kind of interaction between uh, the north and deprivation in terms of uh, some of the patterns that we've seen. This is something that we've uh, talked about in terms of the geographical concept of deprivation amplification, um, whereby does being in a, a deprived 
area within a deprived region lead to an amplification of the impact of deprivations. And this uh, data certainly suggests that that might be the case, uh, particularly when looking at um, uh, COVID-19, uh, but you'll also see a similar relationship when we look at all cause mortality, which is the, ball line, the, the, the blue lines. So when we're talking about, for example, the North-South health divide or more widely talking about regional inequalities in health, something which is a, a focus of the levelling up agenda, then we can see that what we're really talking about is a particular burden on deprived communities in the north via the affluent or deprived areas in the south. The third axis of inequality which is important to, to talk about is to go beyond area public health level measures and to think about individual uh, level measures of socioeconomic status and here the example is taken from um, uh, ONS data look, and PHE data looking at um, inequalities in mortality for COVID-19 by occupation and you can see that for both men and women as broadly speaking um, a social gradient, an occupational gradient in mortality rates, some exceptions, for example, with caring uh, leisure uh, service occupations, for example, for, for reasons that I'll come on to when we talk um, <clears throat> about pathways. But broadly speaking, the more elementary occupations have much higher rates of mortality than the more senior professional uh, occupations. And again, this is a pattern that's reinforced within literature, for example, from our other European countries. Moving beyond <clears throat> socioeconomic status and an important overlaying aspect of inequality that's been particularly highlighted in the United Kingdom through the pandemic is, 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 is the influence of, of ethnicity and how um, very early on in the pandemic it became very clear uh, that minority ethnic groups were experiencing much higher rates of mortality uh, than the than white or white British. And here's just some uh, data from Public Health England, again looking in uh, through to, to March 21. We can see that the mortality rates um, are almost double in black, black British and sort of two and a half times when we look at Asian or Asian British. Some of this is <coughs> related to um, high rates of deprivation in these, in these communities, but that's not um, exclusively uh, the reason for these inequalities. There are other things uh, going on in the background which uh, researchers have been examining. <clears throat> so that's the situation when we're looking at broadly speaking, that the nature of the inequalities that we've seen in COVID, and I apologise that, that, that you're all probably quite familiar with, uh, with some of that data, <coughs> but introduce it obviously as a way of then going on to reflect about the causes. But before we do that, I wanted to talk about the fact that really to those of us working in public health, um, it shouldn't really be a surprise that COVID's had you know, been a very unequal pandemic, because we can see this from our knowledge from our colleagues in, in, in the history of medicine around what's happened in previous pandemics. And, you know, everyone in the beginning of the of COVID was making parallels and talking about what happened in 1918. And we can see that from a health inequalities perspective, <coughs> What happened in 1918 is actually very similar to what's happened today. So there's data from various countries, United States, for example, Sweden, um, Norway, uh, that has shown that there's a high incidence and mortality amongst, for example, the working classes in the Chicago study, unemployed people in um, Swedish studies or lower occupational groups in the Norwegian studies. So the mortality rates were much higher in Spanish flu in these groups <coughs> in those countries. In England, the kind of socioeconomic aspects are less clear from the historical data and it's sort of disputed as to whether there was a gradient or not. However, it was a very clear urban rural divide, uh, both in England and in Wales. <coughs> Pardon me. I'll just talk about that in a little bit more detail. So. <coughs> Uh, this is a uh, drawing on research by the Norwegian historian Sven Erik Mammeland, who looked at historical data of what happened in Spanish flu in, in the city of Oslo, as was Christiana. Um, and he compared the poorest areas of the city with the more affluent areas. And he found that mortality was around 50% higher in the poorest areas 
and that this was also uh, when he looked in terms of occupational indicators, so it wasn't just an area issue, he also did comparison at individual level data, found that mortality um, was much lower amongst the more affluent compared to the working classes. And he also showed this in terms of looking at indicator of affluence, for example, in terms of size of apartments, so those with larger apartments as a sign of affluence at the time, had had lower mortality than those in, in, in much smaller uh, kind of more tenement building accommodations. Looking over into England and Wales and um, working uh, together with the historian Mal Johnson and a geographer colleague at the University of Leeds, Paul Norman, um, I analysed some uh, of the um, uh, data from the Registrar General for England and Wales from 1918. And we wanted to look at whether the regional inequalities that we'd found in COVID-19 were also reflected 100 years ago. And what we can see from the mapping that resulted, and this is for crude death rates, because that's the data that's available um, from the historical record, we can see that there was a very clearly much higher rates in the uh, north, uh, the West Midlands, East Midlands, and over into certain parts of Wales, potentially reflecting urban rural, but also uh, perhaps slightly more uh, than that. On the table, you can see that we wanted to put it into context of what the kind of numbers are in terms of death rates. And uh, obviously the death rate here on average much higher than it is uh, you know, for COVID-19. But we can see that the areas in the country in 1918 that had the highest death rates, for example, Heaven and Jarrow, now part of Tyne and Weir, uh, suburbs of uh, kind of the Newcastle uh, conurbation. Um, they had the mortality rates there were almost six times as high as the lowest areas, such as Sutton uh, in Surrey in the, in the south of the country. So there were certainly very big regional inequalities in the pandemic. Situation in, in, in England and Wales obviously complicated by the context of war and large uh, population movements at the time. Data from places such as Norway, Sweden and the US were less affected by uh, those kind of issues in 1918. Uh, does though of course reinforce this idea of potentially a uh, socio-spatial gradient in 1918. So we've got some parallels um, and thankfully COVID mortality rates much lower than the Spanish flu mortality rates. But we can also draw on more recent um, uh, pandemic experiences. And here we can look back to data from just uh, 2009, looking at H1N1 with the swine flu epidemic. And here we could see from data from Harry Rutter and colleagues that H1N1 mortality was around three times higher in the most deprived quintiles uh, of neighbourhoods compared to the least deprived. Again, echoing uh, 1918, higher in more urban compared to rural areas. And again, there's international data reinforcing this, such as from Canada and the USA, showing associations between hospitalisation rates um, uh, with educational attainment and deprivation. Uh, in relationship to H1N1. So we can see these parallels, we just picked out a couple of uh, examples that we talk about in the book, between the patterns that we're seeing today, the inequalities, the unequal nature of the COVID-19 pandemic, and what we know uh, from previous pandemics. So I want to now talk about when in the context particularly of COVID-19, what what explains the inequalities that we're seeing. And I know some of these were touched upon in, in this morning's uh, sections, but I want to present it within a, a framework which uh, we've called the syndemic pandemic, talking about the interaction of COVID-19, uh, existing chronic diseases, and the wider uh, social and economic determinants of health. And we've drawn the concept of a syndemic uh, from the anthropologist and clinician, uh, Dr. Merrill Singer, where he talked about the interacting risk factors around uh, urban violence, HIV and drug use in um, American cities in the 1990s. At the time, they were being studied very much as separate issues. And he argued that they needed to be looked at together, not as separate epidemics, but as interacting epidemics. And so our argument in drawing on his concept is to say that COVID-19, oh, there's inequalities in it. This is not a surprise, but nor is it separate from the inequalities that we can see in other diseases and the social and economic inequalities in terms of the social determinants of health. Building on this uh, concept, we've talked about how the, the idea of a syndemic pandemic, people's pre-existing uh, structural social inequalities then lead to inequalities in an emergent infectious disease. And we've uh, built on the framework to talk about four different pathways, 
whereby the inequalities, the interaction between deprivation and COVID-19 outcomes have been seen. And the first one is around a uh, pathway around unequal exposure. So thinking about how people are exposed to COVID-19, particularly thinking about the early waves of the pandemic when there were control uh, measures in place. So people working in uh, sectors with greater exposure um, would in, in turn have high risk of case and therefore high risk of mortality. And that reflects back onto those occupational inequalities we saw, for example, with higher rates for the care sector. The second pathway is around unequal transmission. So this is once we have an infection within the community, we can see that certain housing and neighbourhood conditions, be it urbanity and, and higher population density, or be it within an individual home that might be smaller, overcrowded and have uh, less ability to self-isolate if you have a case within the household, all of which is more common, more prevalent uh, amongst more deprived uh, groups. The third pathway is around um, what happens when someone uh, gets uh, COVID-19 in terms of the likely outcomes. And here we talk about the idea of susceptibility. So you become a case, but your outcome, whether it's mortality or recovery or long COVID can be shaped uh, by long-term uh, adverse exposure to, to previous kind of living and environmental conditions. So for this, we're drawing on some of the data that's an analysis that's been done, for example, around seasonal flu and, and how people um, are more prone to having more severe symptoms, potentially through psychosocial pathways. The fourth pathway is around unequal vulnerability to so again reflecting on what happens uh, if you become infected with COVID-19. And here we draw in the, the, the issue around um, the higher burden of chronic conditions, um, for example, around COPD, for example, which is much higher uh, amongst more deprived and lower income groups. And is, of course, a big clinical risk factor for, for an adverse outcome from, from infection. We've done some work funded by the Health Foundation, which was uh, looking at these uh, pathways and analysing how we could explain uh, whether they helped explain the inequalities um, that we've seen in the first wave of the pandemic in England in terms of mortality. So to what extent did each of these pathways help explain uh, the deprivation gap? So that kind of twofold difference in mortality rates between the most and least deprived neighbourhoods. Using a decomposition approach, uh, we've modelled the pathways using various area level factors. Um, we use principal component analysis to put various factors into different pathways and then calculated uh, what extent of that gap was was explained by these different pathways. And this varies from around 30% uh, of the inequality between areas being explained by exposure, up to over 80% being explained in terms of uh, community transmission uh, factors. In addition uh, to the path four pathways that we talked about, which was very much focused on work we'd done in the early waves of the pandemic, we of course now need to think about what could be emerging as a fifth pathway, which is around um, healthcare treatment and particularly around um, access to vaccines and to think about um, unequal vaccines. And we can see and we, uh, the, the, the data shows that with, say, second and third doses, the uptake has been very divergent across socioeconomic groups. So here's an example as of um, uh, last October, where there was a big uh, kind of kind of mopping up of the rollout of the second uh, uh, vaccine, we could see that the gap um, was around uh, double between the most and least deprived in terms of people's uptake of the vaccine. And that, of course, is, has the potential to play out not just in terms of cases, but again, in terms of outcomes and, uh, and recovery. So just for the final few minutes, I wanted to reflect on what does all this mean in terms of how we go forward uh, and from the from the pandemic and uh, from the inequalities uh, that have now been highlighted, exacerbated um, by the, our experiences, both in terms of the health side of the experiences, but also in terms of what we heard about this morning, for example, in terms of the unequal experiences of educational lockdowns um, and social distancing and so on. And certainly we can see <clears throat> the politicians uh, different countries across the spectrum have been talking about this uh, idea of building back better, levelling up, however we want to phrase it, uh, after the pandemic. So from a health inequalities perspective, I wanted to just, just to reflect on some historical examples of where we've, societies have faced similarly large challenges 
and have found ways of reducing inequalities. And this would obviously help us in, in terms of not just from a social justice perspective, but also from uh, building back better from an economic perspective, and also in terms of future uh, preparedness for pandemics in terms of having a healthier population. And so the first historical example I want to talk about is a great society, the civil rights and the war on poverty, which is a big reform uh, agenda that uh, was initiated by Lyndon Johnson in, as president um, in the 1960s in America. This is the period in which Medicare, Medicaid, the, the, the state funded uh, side of the health system in the US was introduced. Big um, improvement in terms of the uh, kind of uh, social security and welfare state side of things through the war on poverty, introduction of their main um, welfare benefit, which at the time was called aid for dependent children. And obviously the abolition of segregation in, in, in the southern states of the US uh, and the equalization of voting rights. Work by Nancy Krieger and colleagues at Harvard University have been examining the impact of this great reform uh, period on health inequalities in the states. And they found that um, it, both racial and income inequalities in premature mortality and infant mortality rates declined after the introduction of, of these uh, big changes uh, to, to healthcare, uh, social security, and political uh, participation. Um, and this was particularly the case we can see in terms of uh, changes in, in the southern states where removing the segregation, the Jim Crow laws, uh, led to big reductions in, in, in racial inequalities, for example. And they've also done work that shows in relation to other health outcomes, um, such as breast cancer, so rates and mortality. The second example, um, which may perhaps be more um, relatable in terms of uh, regional inequalities and the levelling up agenda, is what happened in Germany after uh, reunification and the fall of the um, <laughs> we say the fall, maybe it's uh, the resurrection now, but certainly the original fall of, of, of the Eastern Bloc. So here we can see in the two charts life expectancy for men and women in East in red and uh, West Germany in blue from the 1960s through to 2010. You can see at the point of reunification uh, when East Germany ceases to exist and becomes amalgamated back into unified Germany in 1990. The life expectancy gap between East and West for both men and women is around four years. And then, as you can see, particularly uh, obvious on the graph for women, is that within a very short epidemiological time frame, you know, one generation, 20 years, that life expectancy gap has completely disappeared for women and is around six months uh, for men. So this is a very rapid uh, shift in terms of health inequalities. And whilst people are still discussing, debating it, particularly in Germany, as to how it happened, I think there's probably two or three pathways that we can think about. One is around a massive investment in the East German healthcare system to get it up to uh, contemporary standards. The second is a big improvement in terms of people's nutrition, health behaviours, access to healthier food. And the third one, um, relates to big increases in income, particularly for pensioners, as part of the reforms. There was also investment into modernising German in East German industry as well. And this has all been funded through a solidarity surcharge, a tax charged on both East and West citizens uh, to fund the reunification process. So when we're talking about North-South health divide and regional inequalities uh, post-COVID, um, it's quite tempting to think these things take a long time to shift. What can we do? I think the German example tells us that it can be changed at scale and that there are policy mechanisms that can be done within the gift of a national government. And just briefly, my third example, uh, somewhat closer to home, is looking at the impact of the national health inequality strategy that ran in England from 2000 to 2010. And this had a variety of uh, different uh, interventions and policies from um, health action zones at an area level, uh, at sure start children's centres, introduction of national minimum wage, child tax credits and so on. The big reduction in child poverty in this period and a big reduction in poverty uh, amongst pensioners. 
Um, and there was also targeted NHS resource into more deprived neighbourhoods with, with a weighting added into the NHS formula. In these two graphs, uh, we can see uh, data from uh, Ben Barr at uh, Liverpool and my colleague Thomas Robinson at Newcastle showing what happened between the 20% most deprived local authorities and the rest of England in terms of mortality amenable to healthcare and also in terms of infant mortality rates. And what you can see is that over the policy period, there was a decrease in the inequality in, in both of, the, of these outcomes. Um, and certainly if we look at infant mortality rates, then post 2010, uh, more recent research has shown that there's now been an increase again in child poverty and a corresponding increase in infant mortality rates. So again, it doesn't necessarily have to be the big bang Lyndon Johnson, Helmut Kohl approach, it can also be what might be seen as a more business as usual approach in terms of um, public health and social policy interventions within the UK context. So just to conclude, a bit of a whistle stop tour, doing a book in 20 minutes, but hopefully you can um, uh, go and have a look at it if you wish to, 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 to fill in any gaps that, that I might have left. As we know from the sessions today, COVID-19 outcomes have been worse in less advantaged groups and communities. In our book, we argue that we can think about this in terms of a syndemic, that we have the interaction of COVID with pre-existing health and social inequalities. We can look back to the past and see that these inequalities were not unexpected uh, and that they parallel uh, particularly what we see from 100 years ago. In terms of where do we go from now, Obviously, the government's drawing up its white paper, drawing up economic um, uh, redevelopment plans, uh, looking at the regions. And I think we can learn from what we know from the past levelers that healthcare investment, social policy investment, poverty reduction, and the political incorporation of um, minority groups can be helpful uh, in terms of reducing health inequalities. And of course, from a, both a, a health inequalities and a pandemic uh, sort of uh, prevention uh, focus, we need to think about reducing inequalities in non-communicable diseases going forward. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to uh, the discussion later. Thank you very much, Claire, for a very interesting talk. Uh, yeah, if you could stop sharing your screen, please, so I can see if there's any hands up. Does anybody have any questions for Claire? Well, okay, while well, you're thinking, um, I just have one quick question for you. I, I was just wondering as you were speaking there and you were going through the German example, and you said that um, in, in the East they've improved healthcare, nutrition, income, that, that these sort of factors. Do those sort of factors relate to um, the North? The North, I, I mean, I, I was quite struck by how, how different the north-south divide was that you showed early on in your presentation. Which of those factors are most dominant in this country? Or maybe it's something else. Where, where does the focus on the levelling up need to be, I suppose, is what I'm really asking, in your yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a different context. And of course, what you got in the East was a much more uniform, right? <laughs> in every sense, uh, spread of those factors, right? So the healthcare was poor across all of East Germany in comparison to West Germany. But what I showed in the COVID regional side, for example, is that actually, if you're in a affluent uh, local authority in the North, then on average, your health is the same as an affluent per, per local authority in the South. So the real issue is the extent of deprivation in the North and the fact that deprivation in the North has a more powerful influence on health outcomes than it does in other areas in the South. And that's something uh, that we're investigating. I don't have the answer to why that is at the moment. But in terms of what should the focus be on, then I do think um, on the kind of margins, there's a case for, in, you know, for uh, increase in the allocation around NHS funding to, to more deprived areas, which in turn would be to more for the North. Um, 
you know, not least because we will have longer waiting lists uh, as a result of higher hospitalizations in the north and to do with higher population demand for services. But more broadly, and perhaps not a surprise to, to colleagues who know me, is that I do think that, you know, there's a very strong relationship between poverty and adverse health outcomes. And we can see very strongly the relationship in a kind of almost dose response between uh, the input into to, 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 to child poverty and input mortality rates and of course we know that follows through across the life course yeah. thank you thank you very much thanks Alan. Um, i think we'd probably better move on now